our topic today is the future of Kurdistan, and our speaker is uh, no stranger to this forum, uh, Colonel retired Bob Hervey. He spent the last six years of his career, military career, on the faculty at the Army War College, and I know a number of folks sitting here came up to reacquaint themselves with Bob. He was designated a Foreign Area Specialist in 1967. After graduating from the Defense Language School in Monterey, he earned his master's degree in Middle East Area Studies from the University of Utah. Bob sub subsequently served multiple tours in Turkey, including a year as a foreign exchange student at the Turkish War Academy, and two assignments in the American Embassy serving as the Army Attaché. He has traveled extensively in the Middle East to include visits to Iran, Israel, and Pakistan. He's also traveled back to Turkey on three occasions since his retirement. Bob has maintained an active interest in Middle Eastern political and military affairs. He's a member of the Turkish American Council and has attended several meetings and educational forums associated with that association. So please uh, join me in welcoming Bob back to the podium. Sir? Let's do this first. Uh, get a volume check here and make sure you're all hearing me. Does it sound all right? This mic is right here, so if they tell me, I can turn my head and it'll still pick up the uh, conversation, so hopefully so. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, the title of this presentation, frankly, uh, was not my choice. It was the American Foreign Policy Association. My comment is that any time that you're talking about anything in the Middle East and you start with the phrase, the future of, <laughs> you are in the category of, if not wild speculation, something not far from it. So um, I will proceed to provide a perspective, my own, with regards to uh, the situation in that part of the world, and, uh, and then at the end I will dare to even suggest some fu possible future outcomes. Well, let's start with geography, and I don't know how I'm going to point at both maps at the same time, but um, this is a kind of a standard map of the, of the Middle East, um, and what I want you to particularly note is, you know, we've got uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, a lot of stans, but where is Kurdistan? Well, <clears throat> I would hope that most of you know that Kurdistan does not exist as a national entity. It never has. As a state, which is typically defined as a uh, permanent population, a defined territory, a central government, and the ability to conduct relations with other countries, Kurdistan has never existed. It is, in fact, in the words of Susan Messelis in her great book, In the Shadow of History, uh, it is a place that exists in the minds of more than 40 million people, the largest ethnic people in the world without a state of their own. So what are we talking about when we're talking about Kurdistan? Well, we're talking about an area where the Kurds live for the most part. Now, this map is not as good as it was when I looked at it on a piece of paper, but there's a tan area here which basically describes where the Kurds live in four countries, in Iraq, in Turkey, in Syria, and in Iran. And it's contiguous but they are actually separate regions. Culture, yes. I'm sorry? Well, I'm going to talk about each, each country, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Iran. Uh, oh, I see, the, you, you mean the Kurdish area. Okay, I'm sorry. Basically, this, this tan, or yeah, I think it's tan area is where the, the, the Kurds basically live. And I'm going to show you some other maps with a little more detail. Um, it's an area approximately the size of France, the same size. And they are designated, 
uh, North Kurdistan in Turkey, South Kurdistan in Iraq, West Kurdistan in Syria, and East Kurdistan in Iran, and that's because they are in the North, the South, the East, and the West. I would hope that's kind of obvious. Um, so um, there's approximately a population, about 23 million Kurds in Turkey, 10 million in Iraq, and somewhere between 4 and 10 million in Iran. Uh, that number is widely varied depending on what you're reading. About 2.5 million in Syria. A total of probably about 40 million in this geographic area. There are another 2 million Kurds in Europe, mostly in Germany and Holland. Um, about a half a million in Azerbaijan and Georgia over here on the, on the uh, Russian areas, or former Russian areas, uh, near uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Um, in terms of percentage of national territory, approximately 10 to 15 percent of the national ter territory of Iraq and Syria are comprised in this Kurdish area, less than 10 percent of Iran, and probably somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of Turkish territory is included in this Kurdistan area. In terms of percentage of population, the K Kurds comprise 20 to 25 percent of Iraq and Turkey's population, less than 10 percent in Syria and Iran. I would add that since the Syri Syrian civil war started four and a half years ago, there have been somewhere between, again, a wild disparity, somewhere between five and nine million Syrian refugees who have moved out of Syria, and two million have probably moved into Turkey, Lebanon, and Iraq each. So there's six million refugees right there, mostly Arab uh, refugees. Um, as far as language and ethnicity is concerned, um, the Kurds, along with most of you, originally were part of the Indo-European migration that, that occurred basically from this area north of the Black Sea. It's on the map, you can't, well, maybe if I go back to the uh, Middle East map, well, kind of. This area north of the Black Sea and, and adjacent to the Caspian Sea, and those migrations in about 4500 BC came down through that area, and some of them went this way to India, and some of them went that way to Europe, and the Kurds were part of that migration sequence. They just didn't go very far. They came down and pretty much settled in that area as it is, as it is located today. As far as language is concerned, well, I should note before I do that that the, <clears throat> the Kurds obviously, because of all of the tribes and, and uh, peoples, ethnicities that have passed through that area, a lot of that has been accumulated by the Kurds. And it is fair to say that from an uh, ethnic point of view, from a cultural point of view, and even from a language point of view, um, they are aligned with the Turkmen, the Arab, the Armenians, and a variety of other tribes which also pass through that area and through uh, the modern Kurdistan area. Uh, the language also suggests a varied origin and culture. There are two major languages. Uh, Kermanja is spoken in the north, and Sarani is spoken in the south. And there are two dialects of those languages, Zaza and Garani. These are not subtle differences. The differences between these languages would be similar to pay, perhaps German and English, and the, uh, the subtlety within the uh, dialects are an equal division. As far as religion is concerned, about 70% of the Kurds are Sunni, Muslim, about 15% Shia, mostly in Iran, 10% are Alevi, and Alevi are in fact a branch of Shiism, um, and it's a widespread religion in Turkey, not just amongst the Kurds, and it is an amalgam of Shia, Sufi, and Zoroastrianism. Um, yeah. uh, they, the uh, Alevis are similar, but not the same as the Alawites in 
uh, in uh, Syria that is the party of the religion of Bashar al-Assad. The Kurdish Shia, Shia, as I said, are mostly in Iran. The uh, other 5% are mixed Christian, Sufi, Zoroastrianism, Jewish, and Yezidi, or Yazidi, who you've probably heard about because they received a significant amount of media attention in 2014 when ISIS attacked up through Syria and Iraq. They are pagan. Their principal deity is the peacock angel. Uh, they were a subject of, as I said, intense attention when about 200,000 of them were captured, or not captured, but were surrounded by ISIS in Sinjar province in Iraq in 2014. And uh, ISIS had vowed to annihilate the entire group. They were rescued by US airstrikes and by the Syrian Kurdish militias that basically attacked into Iraq, uh, created a corridor for them to escape through Syria and into northern Iraq where they are accumulated right now. And let me find it here. Yeah, up here in the uh, Erbil Duhak area. Now, there's only about a half million Yazidis or Yezidis in the whole world. Uh, there were some in Turkey in the 1980s, but uh, during one of the purges there, they mostly left, probably uh, 50 or 70,000 of them for Germany. I have prepared some comments here with regards to the Armenian presence in eastern Turkey and the interaction with the Kurds in the period prior to World War I and then up to 1915. I will tell you that I'm going to save that for the question and answer period because it's diverting. And uh, <clears throat> if anybody's interested, you can ask a question during the question and answer period and I'll address it at that time. Well, there's one overwhelming fact of life that we need to understand about the Kurds before I start speaking about the countries uh, specifically and doing a country by country survey, which incidentally, I'm going to do Iraq and Turkey extensively, Syria peripherally, and Iran not at all. And there's a reason for that, which I will tell you later on. But this understanding about the basic nature of the Kurdish history and population, I think is essential to you understanding why there is no Kurdistan. It has to do with the Kurds themselves and the nature of their society since the very earliest times. Um, as I said, the migrations that occurred in that early period resulted in a, a dispersed population in language differences, significant cultural variations, and uh, ultimately, and through today, uh, some very different political perspectives that have reached the point of absurdity. Um, the basic fact of Kurdish life is very similar to what I talked about last year when I was talking about sectarianism in terms of the Shia-Sunni se separation. And I said at that time that, yeah, the Sunni-Shia division, religious division, is significant, but there is a lot of diversity within the Arab population that relates back to the 4th, the 5th, and the 6th century in terms of family, clan, tribal, and confederation of tribes loyalties, which continue to today. And that is absolutely true when you talk about the Kurds. A friend of mine who I communicate with and who I have been communicating with on this presentation, um, who spent some, well, I won't tell you who he worked for, but let's just put it that way. His observations on the ground in southeastern Turkey and northern Iraq, one factor transcends the ages. The basic structure of Kurdish society is not altered by their coming into contact with new religions, governments, other ethnic groups, or advancing technology. Their societal structure based on fealty to family, clan, and for lack of a more precise term, tribe, does not change. In terms of governmental structures, the Kurds have traditionally organized into confederations of clans, 
who are brought together under a strong leader whose position, while hereditary, is maintained by protecting the interests of that confederation. The result of that is, unequivocally, the Kurds are not a homogeneous ethnic group. Far from it. And up until the beginning of the 20th century, there was never once, historically, any mention of any kind of a pan-Kurdish union of any kind. And there have been very few local Kurdish mentions, in other words, regional Kurdish mentions of any kind of a unity movement. And those that there have been uh, in the early part of the 20th century mostly failed, failed miserably. And I'll kind of explain more of that when I get into it here. In three of the four countries today, there are movements toward autonomous Kurdish zones. That is, in Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. Uh, there is no movement uh, with, outside of casual conversation about a pan-Kurdish union, but the concern amongst the host countries is if these autonomous zones are allowed to continue, that there may be some discussion of, of a larger union of Kur Kurdish elements and families. However, again, the, the key note to know is that even in the local movements toward union, there is significant difference between the Kurds within the Kurdish communities. There are party differences, there are political differences, there are loyalties to family and clan that go back uh, centuries that are still very much a part of the whole equation. Well, let me turn now to a brief, I hope, uh, well, let me just comment a little bit more about a few locations here because I'm going to mention them as I go along and I'll try to do this on both sides. Uh, the, whoops, uh, got to be smarter than the machinery. Huh? Um, the capital of northern Iraqi Kurdistan, it's actually southern Kurdistan, but northern Iraqi Kurdistan, is Erbil, right here. Mosul, which is not on the map, is right here. It's, it's in Iraq territory that is concurrently, currently controlled by ISIS. The Kirkuk location is now in Iraqi Kurdistan. It wasn't in 2014. Iraqi Kurdistan was back here, and this was all a part of the Iraqi Baghdad government territory. But in 2014, when ISIS attacked, the Peshmerga, the, the Kurdish military force, moved forward to this line and have maintained it, and I will tell you that today they say that's it, that they are not moving back from it. Suleimania is the location of the other Turkish political, or Kurdish political party that is contending and has contended and is fact has fought a war with the political party that is occupying Erbil. So again, this history of intra-Kurdish warfare uh, has existed even here within this area. When the Yazidis were rescued from Sinjar, they were taken out of uh, Iraq over into Syria and came back up through Syria to Dahuk, which is where they are pretty much right now. So that, I'll come back to this map. This is, a, this is not an absolutely correct map. This shows the Syrian uh, Kurdish occupied territory along all of the Turkish border. It's not true. Right here, the Euphrates River comes down, and the Kurdish controlled area is all the way from the Iraqi border to the eastern bank of the Euphrates River. From the western bank of the Euphrates River over here to Air El Frin is ISIS controlled today and still is. This territory is significantly under dispute as far as Turkey is concerned because they do not want the Kurds to occupy that territory, even at the point of pushing ISIS out. From their perspective, 
The Syrian Kurds are a bigger enemy than our, is ISIS. ISIS's headquarters is here at Raqqa. That, that location is critical because there's a direct line over here to Mosul, and that's where the money flow and how the uh, Iraq, uh, ISIS is getting its money and, and, and the possible attack on Mosul, which I'm going to talk about later on, is a critical factor in all of that. Just to give you, a, I hope you guys over there can kind of follow what I'm doing here. Okay. Let me, well, that, yeah, let me just mention that Iran, remember I said it's less than 10% of the territory of Iran. It is this strip which goes up to Armenia uh, along here, Turkey, uh, obviously along the Iraqi border, which has been penetrated by uh, Kurds on both sides frequently, and, uh, and down here to, well, not, not quite that far, not, not quite to Shiraz. So it um, gives you an idea of the location. So I'm going to spare you about 1,400 years of history. I'm glad you're, you hear that in, in terms of Middle East convolution and jump right into the end of the uh, beginning of the 20th century. At that time, Russia, France, Great Britain, Germany, Italy, and some other lesser powers were executing power politics as the Ottoman Empire was disintegrating. And they were all getting their oar in that water. During that time, there were a few Kurdish voices speaking about the possibility of some kind of a unity and an entity, state entity for Kurdistan. But those were a few and far between, and they really weren't very, very effective. And in every case, they were overwhelmed uh, by either their own inter Nicene warfare or by their host country uh, violently putting down those, those movements. Um, despite, I, I would note, here's a, a, a comment by a Major Noel. He's a British uh, intelligence officer who traveled throughout Iraq and Turkey in the uh, immediate aftermath of World War I. And his comment was that, that the Kurds just simply cannot get their act together and are unlikely to do so, uh, so, so that they could provide any kind of a, a, a united front via via their host countries. Uh, despite the northern Kurdish support for, uh, for Germany during World War I, in other words, the Kurds were aligned with uh, Turkey and Germany against Russia and, and the West in World War I. And nevertheless, in the aftermath of World War I, there was some movement toward the possibility of a Kurdish nation in eastern Anatolia. Um, Woodrow Wilson's 12th point, and I love uh, Lloyd George's comment about Wilson's 14 points. He said, even God only had 10 points. <laughs> But uh, this was Wilson's 12th point, and basically what he said is, yeah, Turkey should be preserved in some kind of a uh, Turkish uh, state, but the nationalities who were under Turkish rule should be ensured security of life, and he used the word in the point, autonomy, or uh, opportunity of autonomous development. Well, everybody was excited about that, thought that was a great idea. Um, now, let me go back. The uh, Treaty of Sevri, which ended World War I for Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, also mentioned the possibility of both the rejuvenation of an Armenian state in eastern Turkey and the possibility of a Kurdish state. Neither of those came anywhere close to happening for two reasons. The implementation of the infamous sikh pico Agreement an agreement between the foreign ministers of France and Britain in 1915 and 1916, basically carving up the Middle East and creating Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, was implemented, and that's exactly what happened. The Arabs had been double-crossed, betrayed, and there was no chance for any kind of uh, Kurdish uh, union at, in the context of the 
mandate system that was created by the, the great powers. Plus the fact, about this time, Britain discovered this little um, element of a 100 kilometer long and a 12 kilometer wide and unknown depth pool of oil that existed between Kirkuk and Mirsul, Mosul. Still exists today, still being fought over today, still being utilized. It is one of the easiest extraction, extraction pools of oil in the world. And uh, when the British discovered that, they said, we're here to stay. Sorry, we're not going anywhere. British Petroleum and, and the Brits are here to stay. And that's exactly what happened. In Turkey, the idea of a Kurdish state was overwhelmed by Mustafa Kemal, later to become Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He, when the Treaty of Sivri was going to carve up Turkey into a little football in Anatolia, said no way. And he launched a war of national liberation. He fought the Greeks and the Armenians, and, and he faced down the Brits over the Straits and the French over Syria. And within about 19 or 20 months, he won his war of national liberation and created Turkey within the borders that it exists today with one notable exception. In the immediate aftermath of that victory, Ataturk made noises about getting along with the Kurds. Then he changed his mind. And nobody knows exactly how that happened, but he did. And he embarked on what is now called a policy of Turkification. Uh, what that meant for the Kurds is that they were non-existed. No language, no schools, no associations, no town names, nothing that reflected Kurdish ethnicity. The Kurds were designated, quote, Mountain Turks, unquote. And that was that. And that was true until the late 1990s. So the entire time that I was in Turkey, over six years, I never once heard a Turk use the word Kurd. They were mountain Turks. Similarly, in Iran, the recently arrived Reza Shah Pahlavi established the monarchy in the Pahlavi dynasty that lasted from 1925 to 1979. Its focus was to modernize Iran while suppressing ethnic and religious diversity. Also, similarly, Iranian Kurds were hopelessly divided amongst themselves, frequent clashes, and extreme violence. It's noted, however, for one very brief moment in time, for about eight months in 1946, as the British and the Russians were diverted and paying more attention to each other with regards to Iran's fate, the Iranian Kurds established the Republic of Kurdistan in um, Mohaba, Mohaba. It lasted for 18, uh, eight months and was overwhelmed by an Iranian military campaign at that time. Uh, its leaders were hung publicly and uh, those, some of them did escape to Russia uh, with, the, with the Russians. All right. Let me, let me talk a little bit about Iraq. Sorry about running back and forth in these. In 1979, both Saddam Hussein and Ayatollah Ali Khomeini came to power. Eight months later, they, 18 months later, they went to war. The Iran over Iraq War lasted from 1980 to 1988. Accusing the Kurds of supporting Iran, which to some extent they did, in 1988 Saddam launched the Anfal campaign. Anfal means the spoils of war in the Quran. His cousin, cousin Ali Hassan al-Majadi, came to be known as Chemical Ali, was in charge. On March 16, 1988, in Halibja, 
5,000 Kurds, mostly women and children, were killed by bombs carrying sarin and mustard gas. Thousands of others were caustically burned inside and out, and many died wretchedly and early. The war lasted about 20 months against the Kurds. Um, a total of 182,000 Kurds were outright killed. Uh, 4,500 villages were totally destroyed. And it ended only because Saddam, looking south, decided to invade Kuwait. He did that in February of 1991, uh, or August of 19, uh, 1990, and in February of 1991, the U.S., after a six-week bombing campaign and a four-day ground war, uh, totally crushed the uh, Iraqi forces in Kuwait and had them retreating. But the U.S., as you know, U.S. and Allied forces stopped on the road to Baghdad. And unfortunately, Saddam was able to move two of his guard divisions back into the Baghdad area. At President Bush's urging, that's President Bush the first, um, the Shias, I mean, sorry, the Kuni, Sunnis and the Kurds uh, were encouraged to revolt against Saddam Hussein. They did, and because he still had significant military force, he crushed those, uh, those rebellions. And uh, it was only because the U.S. at that point in time realized that they had made a terrible mistake, but they embarked on two operations. Operation Provide Comfort, which was basically a humanitarian effort to provide food to the Kurds uh, through Turkey, and later Operation Northern Watch, which was a no-fly zone, no-exist zone for Iraqi military forces above the 36th parallel. That occurred uh, in 1992 and caused the Iraqi military forces to withdraw to an internal boundary uh, with Iraqi Kurdistan called the Green Line. And that's peace in our time, right? Well, not exactly. <clears throat> in the aftermath of the Iraqi military withdrawal, the two principal Kurdish political forces again separated by clan and by location, Suleimania and Erbil, uh, got together momentarily and thought that they might create an overall Kurdish regional government. However, it didn't happen. Economic concerns, power concerns, who's in charge concerns, rose their ugly head, and in 1994 they went to war. And for four years, these two Kurdish entities within Iraq fought a very, very bloody war with casualties way over 100,000. Um, finally, in 1988, an uneasy peace was negotiated by the United States, and uh, that continued to exist as a prelude to September 11th, 2001, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Let me jump forward here a little bit, because I've been talking about um, who's who, and I think it's, you know, if you want to take a couple notes at this point in time, maybe you can, you can understand who these people are. Uh, in Iraq, the founder of the one Turk, uh, Kurdish party was Mustafa Barzani. His son, Masoud, became the president when Mustafa died and is the head of the KDP, and he still is today. The KRG is the overall Kurdish regional government that now is, is responsible for uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. He is the uh, president of the KRG, and his competitor, Jalal Talabani from Suleimania, is the president of Iraq. It's strictly a ceremonial position, doesn't mean a thing. Um, as I said, El Abadi is the current Prime Minister of Iraq. Al Sistani is the, that should be Ayatollah. Uh, Muqtadar al Sadr is the leader of the Shia uh, Mahdi army in, uh, near Baghdad. And Nouri al Maliki, a real neat guy, is uh, the former Prime Minister. 
In Turkey, uh, Erdogan is the president, Davutoglu is the prime minister, and Abdullah Ocalan, whose name I will mention frequently here in talking about the PKK, the Kurdish party in Turkey, and Selahattin Demirtas, who is the head of the Kurdish-focused uh, political party in Turkey, at least at the moment. Bashar al-Assad and President Salah Muslam, who is the head of the Syrian Kurdish political and military entity. And as I said, I'm not going to talk very much about Iran, so I'll skip that for now. And this is, gets hard now. This, I'm sorry about that. But KRG is the Kurdish regional government. That's the government of Barzani in Erbil. The KDP is his political party. The PUK is Talibani's party over in Suleimania. Garan is a new political party that just emerged in 2012, which is talking about change as being its motto and trying to get rid of some of the uh, corruption and, and uh, so on. And the Peshmerga, they are the military force of Iraqi Kurdistan, and they have this morale-boosting name, those who stand before death. And I'm sure that's very, che very cheery to recruits. In Turkey, um, oops, in Turkey, the HDP is the Kurdish political party that emerged in 2012, the first legitimate political party in Turkey. It's having its problem at the moment. The PKK has been around for a long time. I'm going to talk about them, the Kurdistan P uh, Workers' Party. The YDG is their, is their military group and youth group, and don't worry about that one. And the PYD is the Democratic Union Party in Syria, it's the Kurdish party, and the YPG is their military arm. Okay, you got all that? Good. All right. Continuing in Iraq, the month-long campaign to topple Saddam was almost too successful, certainly too fast for any thought to be given to what's next. That's the George Bush uh, attack into Iraq. The follow-on administration, led by Ambassador Paul Bremer, was controversial to say the least and incredibly inept to say the most. A transitional administrative law was enacted, which was supposed to lead to democratic reforms in Iraq, uh, but instead the Iraqi insurgency began. In 2014, uh, ISIS attacked, 2013-2014, in Syria and Iraq, and conquered 40% of Iraqi territory, of Iraqi and Syrian territory. Uh, the TAL, that transitional law had, which had been passed, um, nevertheless, the Kurds took to heart. And they passed their own constitution for Iraqi Kurdistan because they were totally being overlooked by Baghdad and the Iraqi government, and to some extent the U.S. And they wrote their own constitution. Now, here's what they did, the KRG in northern Iraq. They defined their own territory. They established a central authority. They established a military force. They established an economic policy based on the development and selling and sharing of their assets, which is primarily oil. They created their own flag and their own national anthem. Does that sound a little bit like statehood? It sure sounds like statehood to an awful lot of people who are observing that scene today. From 2004 to 2014, uh, the Kurdish authorities tried to stay out of the Sunni-Shia fight that was going on in the insurgency and uh, to essentially develop their own economy in northern Iraq, which they did very successfully. From, 19, from 2007 on, they established a strategic relationship with Turkey Interesting, but uh, they did, which led to all kinds of development activities, construction, oil pipelines, big, tall apartment buildings and nice-looking hotels the way you see in uh, other parts of the Middle East. Um, all to the disfavor of everybody who was looking in. Baghdad, the only support they were getting was, was from, from Turkey. Um, Mosul, as I said, had been captured by ISIS in 2014. Um, it was only because of the Peshmerga's intervention that the ISIS was stopped where they are. 
Um, Nouri al-Maliki had, had been the prime minister of Iraq. He, uh, he, he was distinguished, in my opinion, by a, a confrontation he had with Condoleezza Rice at the White House uh, in the 2012 era where she stood in front of him and screamed at him, you are the worst prime minister in the history of mankind and you are soon going to be hanging from a lamppost. And Condoleezza Rice is one of my favorite people, has been ever since. <laughs> El Abadi was uh, replaced in 2014. I mean, sorry, Nouri al Maliki was replaced in 2014. When the Bush administration announced its withdrawal from Iraq in 2007, the Kurdish administration proceeded to exert its autonomous authority and develop its economy, and particularly with regards to its relationship with uh, Turkey. <clears throat> ISIS suddenly in 2014 found itself with a 100 kilometer border with ISIS. Um, they have been an uneasy status quo since that initial contact. Uh, as I had said, the Peshmerga, the Kurdish Peshmerga had encompassed Kirkuk and the Kirkuk oil field uh, in, that, in the aftermath of that. The Iraqi army had abandoned equipment and run with their tail between their legs, and then had the audacity to object to the uh, Peshmerga's uh, advance into Kirkuk and controlling that, that area. As I said, an uneasy un status quo is existent at the moment. There is conversation, and I think it's just that, to retake Mosul. Well, number one, who's going to do it? Is it going to be the Iraqi army? Or are the Kurds going to be mobilized and outfitted and provided with the appropriate weapons to do so? Nobody knows. But if it's any kind of a combined operation where the Peshmerga and the Iraqi army do liberate Mosul and kick ISIS out, they're going to stop when they're successful and look at each other and say, you're next. And, and it is not going to be, in my opinion, a uh, pleasant outcome. Okay, let me turn to Turkey real quick. I've got a few minutes left here. I left off talking about Mustafa Kemal, and I'm going to go back to that Middle East map. I think that's the only one that actually describes Turkey here. Well, that'll work. Yeah. Um, as I said... Uh, Mustafa Kemal had enforced a policy of Turkification after winning the war. There were uprisings in the uh, 1920s and early 30s. 25, Sheikh Saad, 1928-30, Mount Ararat, 1937-38, Der Sim. All ended with overwhelming Turkish military response, uh, the public hanging of the leaders, and I've got some wonderful pictures of those, and significant collateral damage and disruption in the Kurdish village populations. Millions of Kurds were resettled, moved about, shuffled about during each of those uh, occurrences. The modernization in the eyes of the Kemalist Ataturk Ankara government was a uh, homogeneous nationalism without any influence of ethnicity or religion. No influence of ethnicity and religion. Following Ataturk's death, he was succeeded by Ismet Inanu, who continued the Ataturkian Kemalist policy. And even after Ismet Inanu was defeated in the first public election in 1960, or 1950, nevertheless, the military by that time had assumed responsibility for ensuring that the nationalist, secular view of Mustafa Kemal continued unequivocally. In the late 50s and early 60s, a leftist, Socialist movement began in the Turkish labor unions and spread to the universities. It had a distinctive communist taint to it and was supported by external communist sources. In the leftist movement's wake, there also arose a hardcore right-wing fascist responding group which reacted vehemently to the leftist activities. In 1978 and 80, during my time as the assistant attache in Ankara, there was near-constant warfare in the streets, daily killings, 
and significant threat to foreigners. The PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, was officially born in November 1978. It was a byproduct of the leftist revolutionary movement and was led by a small group of dedicated, radical Marxist-Leninists. The charter of the PKK called for an independent Kurdistan in southeast Turkey, a worker-peasant alliance, and to act as the vanguard of a global socialist movement to create greater Kurdistan. PKK in Turkey was the first ones who actually did that. And they saw Iraq and Iran and Syria, the Kurds, joining in. The leadership of the PKK was assumed by Abdullah Öcalan. Uh, from the beginning, the PKK was the most violent of the insurgent groups, utilizing ambush, assassination, roadside bombings, suicide missions, almost always by women, and tactics which today are described as unequivocally terrorist. An encompassing military coup by the Turkish military in September 1980, General Kenan Evren, who had had enough, put everybody in jail. All the political parties, all the leaderships, anybody who had a leftist or a rightist label of any kind. And, needless to say, Ojalan and the PKK had a huge target on their back. The entire Kurdish population was suspect, and therefore, the significant military forces moved into southeast Turkey. I, I was standing on a balcony, third floor of the officers' club, with a corps commander in Malatya. And uh, this was mid-afternoon. And he commented to me, and you know, I didn't even know he spoke English. He had spoken nothing but Turkish with me to that point, but suddenly turned to me and said in English, it looks peaceful, doesn't it? Looking out, looking out over the Malatya street scene, and he says, after 10 o'clock, it's a war zone. Uh, Ojalan got the message, left Turkey, went to Syria. He was supported by Hafiz al-Assad. Why? Assad, this is Bashar al-Assad's father, wanted Hatay back, that little blip of Turkey that stretches down into Syria, right here. And that was passed to Turkey in 1938, and Syria has always wanted it back. The circumstance of its passing to Turkey was suspect, to say the least. Uh, Ocalan set up housekeeping in Damascus. His headquarters was in the Baka Valley in Lebanon. He was part of the, uh, supported by the PLO and by the earliest uh, elements of uh, the Hezbollah. Uh, Ocalan continued cross-border war for the next uh, 14 years. He targeted not only the Turkish military, but he also targeted Kurdish elites, educators in the Kurdish area, those who were not necessarily in favor of armed revolution. Uh, he was ruthless. He, uh, they had established uh, training camps in the Kandil Mountains in northern Iraq at this time, and Turkey began in 1992 to attack into Iraq to try and conquer and and destroy the PKK. They were never successful in doing it. Um, but the population in Turkey took a beating. Again, millions of Kurds were forcibly displaced from the villages, and they became what's known as the Gecikandu population in Turkey. This is around the major cities, uh, all of the major cities, but particularly Ankara and, and uh, Istanbul, where they would set up overnight uh, a shack, and once the sun arose the next day, if that shack had a roof on it, that was a legitimate home. Millions of people were living around these major cities in that, in that time frame. Ojalan's welcome in Syria ended in 1998. Assad had been influenced by the fact that Turkey said, we're going to dam up the Euphrates River and not one drop of water is going to get to Syria. Assad got the message. He uh, told uh, Ojalan to leave. He did. He appeared in Moscow, Rome, Amsterdam, and Athens. Finally, in Nairobi, Kenya, and he was captured by the Turkish military or National Intelligence Agency working with the CIA. And in February 1999, he was flown to Turkey, displayed, hooded, drugged, and dazed, 
and jailed in, on Imrali Island in the Sea of Marmara, uh, just off of uh, Istanbul, and he is there today. He was sentenced to death by a military court, but the EU influenced that and commuted it to life imprisonment. Okay, a couple observations about Turkey. I'm getting, getting there. The PKK, the militant element of the Kurdish population in Turkey, has never been supported by a majority position of the Kurdish population. The majority Kurdish population would prefer political reconciliation and recognition and inclusion and to participate in the economic upsurge that has occurred in Turkey in the last 14, 15 years. Having said that, there is no doubt that the logistic and intelligence infrastructure in Turkish Kurdistan exists and does support the PKK. As I said, the war went on until 2012. In 2012, there, had been, there were a ceasefire based on the fact, very surprisingly, as it was announced in the newspaper, that the intelligence organization of Turkey was talking to Ocalan in his jail cell on Imrali Island. And Ocalan still had influence with regards to the PKK, and there was about a two and a half year peace ceasefire. The Turks had insisted that the PKK lay down their arms and come back to Turkey and surrender. PKK never agreed to that, and likely on the PKK side, they were insisting that Turkey recognize the legitimacy of Kurdish economic and uh, political interests in the East. They never came to any kind of an agreement. In 2015, there were parliamentary election and Erdogan lost his parliamentary majority and he was very upset about it. Uh, about a week later, 39 Kurds were killed in a bombing in southern, southern Turkey, in Sirach, and ISIS took credit. The PKK responded to that, blaming the Erdogan government for being soft on ISIS and the Sunni jihadis fighting in Syria and Iraq, and they attacked a Turkish police station and killed two Turkish police officers. Erdogan said, it's over, it's done, no more negotiations, no more in any way dealing with PKK. They are the enemy and we are going to liquidate them, even though how, how he was going to do that is hard to say. But he sent the entire Turkish special forces grouping to the southeast they began to attack the villages that were on the Syrian-Iraqi border, and, uh, and, and the PKK resisted, and there is a war that is raging today as we speak between the Turkish military and the PKK. The cynics, observing all this, said that Erdogan overreacted for one reason, by raising the nationalist flag again he was able to uh, overwhelm the Kurdish political party that had gained seats in the 2015 election. And he, in order to get his parliamentary majority back, he conducted a snap election in November 2015, and he did, in fact, get his parliamentary majority back. Finally, Syria. Syria is a god-awful mess. Relations change weekly, allies become foes, agreements become disagreements, treachery, backstabbing. There's absolutely no way to describe what is happening, who is doing what and why. There are, of course, two wars going on in Syria. The Syrian civil war, now four and a half years old, has been going on with Syrian opposition groups to the administration of Bashar al-Assad and the war with ISIS, now two and a half years old, ongoing. The most confusing factoid in those two wars is that several participants may be allies in one war and enemies in the other. Um, a real
friendly cast of characters, Bashar al-Assad, a Shia leader of an 80% Sunni state, a barrel bomber, a chemical weapons against civilians perpetrator, an all-round bad apple in a barrel loaded with bad apples, uh, supported by Moscow and Tehran. Putin, loving the Latakia and Syrian Mediterranean ports for the Russian Navy, homing, his Air Force supposedly operating against ISIS, but really kicking the hell out of the Syrian opposition up and down the coast. He gets an airplane shot down by Turkey and for all practical purposes has ended relations with Turkey. The Syrian opposition, the Free Syrian Army, which the U.S. has kind of supported, and that's a weak kind of, uh, and another assortment of jihadis and crazies, all clamoring for U.S. weapons, all want to be supported by the U.S. weapons, opposing Assad. President Obama and the U.S. can't sort it out, trust no one, an air campaign and a special forces against ISIS, but wishy-washy about Assad. Erdogan, and not exactly a picture of consistency, uh, thinks he can change Assad uh, to operate democratically via via his Sunni majority. He even suggested at one time that the Muslim Brotherhood be a partner. That must have sent Assad to bed chuckling. But anyway, he, uh, when Assad spurned all of his approaches, uh, Erdogan turned on Assad and became vehemently anti-Syrian and anti-Assad, and as has been accused, perhaps allowed ISIS and Sunni militant groups to operate across the border. Iran has got 12 to 15,000 Hezbollah fighters in Syria, uh, protecting Assad and Damascus. Incidentally, the, the, the 400,000 or 800,000 or 4 million people that are starving to death are between Damascus and Lebanon, in case you want to know where that is occurring. Um, and then there's ISIS, headquartered in Raqqa, pronounced their caliphate, but essentially a non-state in this chaos and obviously following their own agenda. The one clear thing about ISIS is they're not friends with anybody. That's clear. The PYD, the Turkish military, or the Kurdish military group in Syria, um, emerged in 2004. They were definitely associated with the PKK in Turkey. Ocalan was the hero to the, to the uh, PYD leadership. Um, and uh, their group now comprises about 20,000 fighters. It's not an inconsequential group. In November of 1913, they declared the establishment of Rojava along the Turkish border, extending from the Iraqi border, as I said, to the eastern side of the Euphrates. Uh, it amounted to a declaration of a Kurdish autonomous zone in Syria. Um, the 90 kilometer disconnect between the Syrian uh, YPG in Efran and the other side of the Euphrates border is to Turkey kind of the holy grail in terms of the center of the universe because they do not want the Kurds to be allowed to connect up. And they will not accept a, uh, a PYD or a Syrian Kurdish autonomous zone in that area, let alone the one that already exists. The UN brokered peace talks for Syria broke up this morning, did not go anywhere because the opposition parties didn't show up. They've been arguing for six months about who's going to attend and as it turns out, nobody attended. Okay, the future. This takes nerve. <laughs> um, the KRG in northern Iraq. It is a de facto autonomous zone. It, is, it exists as an autonomous zone, very close to, to independence. Barzani could declare dependence at any time. The only problem is he would not be supported by anybody. He would be absolutely on his own, and how Russia, Iran, uh, literally every party to the, the entire situation, how they would react would be hard to say. For the moment, Barzani and Talibani are getting along. Their economic developments are continuing, but 
They have been cut out of the national treasury by the Baghdad government because of their actions. And uh, their relationship with Turkey is key to their future, their economic, commercial relations. And as I said, if the Peshmerga and the Kurds are involved in the liberation of Mosul, it's very difficult to suggest how that's going to come out. As far as Turkey is concerned, the only thing that is different in the current context over what's been in existence since 1925 is that the Erdogan administration is proclaiming the need to develop the Southeast. No kidding. And they're talking about a post-PKK Southeast. In other words, the end of PKK and possibly then a Kurdish entity of some kind. And they are willing to talk Kurdishness now. They do now use the word Kurdish. And in fact, on Turkish airways, they're making announcements in both Turkish and Kurdish now. They are still vehemently no, vehemently no to any future for the PKK. They have to be eliminated. The word autonomy is treason, and recent college professors have been rounded up for circulating a petition which used the word autonomy. And independence? No way. No way. As far as the role of a future Kurdish political party is concerned, it's yet to be determined, but they have to separate themselves, in my opinion, from the PKK. There's absolutely no possibility that a Kurdish political party associated with PKK will survive, and it, it hasn't up till now. In Syria, again, we have a de facto autonomous zone, no recognition by anybody. The Turks are vehement that it is not going to continue. Even the KRG, the, the Iraqi uh, Kurdish uh, government, is cool to it. Interestingly, Assad and Russia are beginning to warm up to the Syrian Kurds. Yeah. And uh, in peace talks, uh, talking about the possibility of Assad's departure, Russian and Iranian influence and the Russian involvement in the fighting in the civil war, I would say that Assad is here for a while. I do not think Assad is going anywhere. ISIS, I think, will continue to be uh, diminished, but they're not going away. And the key to ISIS is Mosul in Iraq and Raqqa in Syria. They still have upwards of 50,000 hardcore jihadi fighters, and the only thing that is going to get rid of ISIS is a total military response. I've gone overboard, I'm sorry. Take about a 15 minute break. What do we, Michael? I, think I saw a hand over here. Yes. We were to ask a question. Well, no, 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 I mean, what you should talk about later on. So include that talk that you talked, you said you were gonna talk about other countries and we should ask a question about it oh, way no. back at the beginning. No, no. No? What I said I was gonna skip over was the Armenian, <laughs> the Armenian confrontation with the, well, I mean, I'm not going to get into a, a huge political thing here, but th there was a catastrophe in southeastern Turkey regarding the Armenians. Now, prior to World War I, this portion of eastern Turkey was populated by approximately equal numbers of Kurds and Armenians. All right. Can you not hear me? That's the problem. Help. <laughs> pop out of the room and. Okay. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. As I said, that, that portion of eastern Turkey was populated by just about equal populations of Armenians and Kurds. Uh, Armenians were Christian still are. Uh, the Kurds were Muslim, still are. Uh, the Turks are Muslim. The Russians were Christian. Well, kind of, but they were, they, they were Christian. But uh, in 1877, the Russians 
basically took the eastern third of Turkey. They conquered it. Um, needless to say, they were nicer to the Armenians than they were to the Kurds. There was displacement. There was continuing battles. The Turkish forces counterattacked, reattacked. There was continuous warfare in the southeast portion of Turkey between Russia and Turkey for the next uh, 30 years. Uh, and the, Kur the Kurds and the Armenians were in the middle of it. In 1915, I'm sorry, in, uh, let me look at my notes here just let me get it straight, make sure I got it straight. Okay, in November of 1914, Turkey entered the war on the part of Germany as an ally of Germany, fighting the Russians. In December, the Turks initiated military operations in the Caucasus up here along this border at a place called Sadakamish. In the history of military operations, there have been few that have been most, more poorly conceived and executed. The Kurds were provided a significant portion of the foot soldiers. It was a disaster. The troops were poorly led and supported, having no winter clothing. This was an attack in uh, November. Thousands simply froze to death, thousands. Uh, the Iranians and the Russians counterattacked and hostilities were uh, going on there. They were particularly horrendous. They were ethno-religious fighting. And that continued until uh, 1915, about six months later, when all of a sudden the Russians decided that their emphasis needed to go into the Central European campaign against the Austrians and Germans. The Armenians were left on their own. They were quickly overwhelmed by a combination of Turkish military leadership and Kurdish militias, which were definitively supporting the Turks. No quarter given, no survivors. Shortly thereafter, the Ottoman port in Istanbul issued a series of decrees which ordered the total deportation of the Armenian population from eastern Anatolia. That order was executed by Turkish gendarmerie and Kurdish militias in April of 1915. And by the end of the year, by the end of 1915, there was no measurable population of Armenians in eastern Turkey. The scale of the fatalities is still being argued by historians. At least one and a half million, probably closer to 1.2 million civilians died in about a six-month period of time. Those Armenians who survived the evacuations ended up in Russia, modern Armenia, and Georgia. Bob, two quick questions. Well, one quick one. Uh, the shadow, the shadow of history, right to my lips. Uh, the the book you talked about, the shadow of history. Who's the author? I have a bibliography up here, which I did not print this year, but you're more than welcome to. To uh, this is a great book. Oh. This is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice lightweight reading. Yeah, uh, it's the author is Susan. M e i s e l a s Mesilas Mesilas, but she has she has gone back and gotten pictures and documents from the British archives, and 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 printed it. And there's a huge section in here in Turkish, if you read Turkish. There's also a section in Kermanja. She, she's done a magnificent job. This is a great book. Unfortunately, it was written in 1997 and hasn't been updated since then. But in terms of history of the Kurds, it's magnificent. OK. My other, thank you. My other question has to do with Ataturk created a secular Turkey. My understanding is, I don't know if I'm right, maybe you can confirm this, that they're more religious now. 
And the question is, how does that play into the right. Kurdistan, Shia, Sunni uh, situation over in the Middle East? Well, Mr. Erdogan, his party in 2002 came to power. He was the um, successor, I guess, follow on to a man named Erbakan, who in the 1970s and 80s organized an Islamic party in Turkey. Up to that time, that didn't exist. Erbakan ended up spending more time in jail than probably any other political leader in, in Turkey. Over, over, and his party was totally uh, dismembered by the Turkish military and government. And there were a couple of successor parties to Erbakan's party. Um, it wasn't until 2002, when Mr. Erdogan came along, that his party, the AKP, which definitely is an Islamist-leaning party, was successful enough in the parliamentary elections to actually uh, gain a majority. And they have exercised that majority in the parliament and in the government for the last 14 years. And Mr. Erdogan is currently the president. He's trying to rewrite the Constitution a la Putin so that he can be the president for a long, long time. That's what he's trying to do right now. Um, how does that affect the Kurdish relationship? Not much. Um, it affects a lot of things about the social and cultural life of Turkey, but... <clears throat> Mr. Erdogan is not really any different from Ataturk with regards to his attitude about the Kurds. They will, they will not be an autonomous, independent uh, entity. And, you know, he's currently, uh, these college professors that signed this petition, he's calling them traitors. And the court is reacting. The, the courts are reacting. And they're arresting these guys. And the EU is reacting. The U.S. government reacted. In fact, there's a slide I never got to, but I wanted to show you. Nehmut Lü Türkem DNA. That's Turk. That's uh, out of Turk. Ten years after the republic was established, and basically he's saying, "How fortunate it is that I can call myself a Turk." It is said. And they, 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 I saw this sign all over Kurdistan. Believe me, that, that was not well received. The anti-terror law. This is, this is Erdogan saying the organization, meaning the PKK, the deputies, meaning the political party, and the municipalities, that is the mayors of these villages in southeast that are providing this logistic infrastructure for the PKK, will answer to the judiciary for what they have done. He's calling on the judiciary to. And then here's uh, John Bass, who's the US ambassador just a few days ago. <clears throat> Maybe. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, you got one back there? He's got one back there. Yes, th yes thank you. Uh, my question is, judging from news reports, it appears the Iraqi Kurds have the most effective military in the area. What kind of support are they getting? Uh, where, uh, how are they, uh, where are they getting their logistics? I mean, how, how are they being equipped as a whole? Where is that colonel that was... <laughs> non-attributional environment here. Uh, I'm going to Erbil uh, in June to be the senior military advisor uh, to the government of Iraq for northern affairs, which equals the Peshmerga. I mean, that's really what that ends up equaling. Uh, it's over 60,000 man force. Still closer than that. Wow, odd. Um, it's about a 63,000 man force total. Uh, there's some economic issues right now in, uh, in the Kurdish region uh, of, of Iraq. Uh, and obviously there, are, there are, will be some contention about how much the GOI, the government of Iraq, supports uh, Peshmerga forces. And as we were talking on the break, I mean, that may become uh, the issue in the retaking of Mosul. 
I've probably opened more questions than I've, than I've answered. Where are they getting their arms right now? Where have they gotten their arms, I guess, is the question. Everybody. Uh, we're, we're giving them a significant amount. Uh, the, the, even the Russians are giving. There's a lot of folks that are lining up to give uh, arms, munition, and funding uh, beyond the government of Iraq. Uh, and, in, and in fact, that may be the significant point of contention is who's supporting versus who's not supporting. And again, that, that probably opens up more questions than it answers, but does well, that answer the question? Well, but the, the point I made that Mosul is going to be a critical point in this whole development going forward, I mean, we both agree on that entirely. Mosul being the key piece here in the very near future, and then uh, Barzani is an old man. Uh, and so one of his two sons is going gonna, is gonna to be the heir. Uh, one of them is much more radical than the other. Uh, we were supporting the less of the two radicals, and it looks like the more radical one is the one uh, who may end up ascending. So, Barzani has actually been the head of Iraqi Kurdistan since, what, 1950? Or 56, I guess. Yeah, a long time. Michael? And then there's a question here, too. Congratulations on your appreciation and your laying out an extraordinarily complex situation. What can you say to... <laughs> what can you say to... Uh, American politicians and pundits who propose simplistic or, uh, solutions to, to these problems? Well, <laughs> I mean, are we talking about the, uh, the respective Democratic and Republican debates, or what are we talking about? I, I frankly think that American policymakers, the existent American policymakers, the people who are in charge at the moment at least, I think they have a pretty good understanding of, of what's going on there and, and who's doing what and, and uh, what the issues are. My, my peripheral viewpoint on that is that there's, there's a good amount of knowledge. It's not politically prejudiced. Uh, it is what it is. But that doesn't make, I mean, knowing that doesn't really tell you what to do really doesn't tell you the solutions, if there are solutions. Um, you know, somebody asked me, I, I don't remember if it was last, it must have been last year, and, you know, what's the, how, are the, how are the problems in the Middle East going to be solved? <laughs> yeah. and, and I said, I don't know, but it's got to come from within. It's got to come from within. And I would say that these parties, these entities, I mean, we can influence, we can support, we can, we can, uh, present our druthers in, in certain situations, but ultimately, they have to decide. And ultimately, they have to decide. And they've been fighting for thousands of years, you know. Is it, is it time for that to come to an end or for them to kind of talk things over? I, you know, I, I made this, I'll, I'll say this, and I, so we'll, I, this is not recorded, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst my friends, I have said, in answer to that question about how is, how is the Middle East going to eventually come to some kind of peaceful resolution and commitment to relationships in a peaceful manner. And you know what the answer is, in my opinion? Women. Plain and simple. It has to start with and continue forward. Education, emancipation, uh, and exerting influence. I think that's the only hope. Now, it's a patriarchal society. If a woman raises her hand, all of that little girl from Pakistan, and says, I think women ought to be educated, boom. It's not going to be pretty. And I don't even know if it'll work. But my opinion is that the more education and influence we provide to women in that part of the world, well, hell in our own world, that, that, uh, that I think that we can come to, I think we can come to more peaceful resolution than we're, than we're doing right now. So there's Hervey on the end of the plank. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, there are so many cross-cutting currents here and shifting alliances, and I, I won't uh, 
pretend to be able to try to make sense out of all of them, but one that I find especially confusing, if I understood you correctly, was with respect to the Iraqi Kurdish autonomous zone and the p potential for an independent state there. I thought that I heard you say, and I thought that the text indicated that there would be tolerance or acceptance or even support of that by the Turks, um, which seems just so severely at odds with everything else going on between the Turks and the PKK and their ferocious resistance to any sort of independent Kurdish state that encroaches on Turkey or in Syria. So what, what gives with that? Well, you're, number one, you're absolutely correct. It is a real dichotomy to try and understand uh, how the Turkish government has in fact rationalized its relationship with the KRG in the light of all of the other uh, influences with regards to the PKK and the PYD. And I, I will tell you very frankly, it, it's oil. It's oil and gas. Um, the KRG has constructed two it's oil and gas. Uh, the KRG has, uh, and the Turks have built two oil pipelines that end in Jehan, which is near Eskenderun, which is down there in southern Turkey. And they've loaded up ships. And you know who's buying that oil? Israel, among others. Russia, amazingly. Uh, there's, there's, uh, the Turks are commercially very happy with the KRG. Now, the KRG independent zone, Syrian autonomous zone or uh, uh, autonomous or independent, that, that just bothers Turkey no end because their population, which is the, the largest population of the Kurds, more than half of all the Kurds are, are in Turkey, that, that may in fact spur the Turkish Kurds onto ideas. Uh, well, and they already have ideas. It's just that the Turks are absolutely convinced it's not going to happen. But you're right. It's a it's a it's a relationship that's hard to understand outside of the fact that, from a Turkish point of view, it's economically um, favorable. Bob, would you venture a, an opinion on U.S. role vis-a-vis -vis Islamic State? Well, um, let's see. We are, we are avowed to the destruction of the Islamic State. We, as a government, as a, as a defense strategy uh, to the destruction of the Islamic State. I, in my comments, I said, they are not, you are not going to get them to the negotiating table. You don't want them at the negotiating table. They, they have nothing to negotiate. So a military solution uh, now, the U.S. would like to carry that out via V um, utilizing somebody else's ground forces, have somebody else on the ground. Um, as the colonel says, the Peshmerga is the best military force in the region right now. Uh, how the U.S. would uh, execute that? Very frankly, right now, the strategy via the ISIS is to get Mosul back and to break the corridor from Mosul to Raqqi, because that is, that is an economic lifeline for the, for the ISIS right now. Uh, and, I, and beyond that, I'm not sure that we have a strategy as to how we're going, I don't know, if we have a strategy as to how we're going to address the ISIS thing other than through a continued uh, air campaign. Now, listen to some of the candidates and you can hear some strategies there that you might uh, feel warm and fuzzy about. Frankly, I don't, but, uh, but uh, I think that's it. I think that uh, our strategy at the moment is to, well, I don't know. You know. The president has been criticized enormously to some degree with, in my opinion, with some good reason for being hesitant, for not, not stepping into it. But the, the Syrian situation, the, the ISIS situation are fraught with uh, missteps. And uh, 
Too careful? Maybe. Not enough careful? Maybe. I don't know. Yes, sir. Uh, the Kurds have been there a long time, and uh, they do a lot of fighting. But in general, what does the population do for a living? How do they, how do they make a living there? Um, well, they, they actually, um, in the KRG, in, in northern Iraq, they're developing an entrepreneurial class that has some middle, middle income kinds of uh, characteristics. Um, the, if you're talking about eastern Turkey, you're still basically talking about an agrarian economy, for the most part. Um, Having said that, they have water now. All of the uh, various dams that the Turkish government has built over the last 30 or 40 years have created a significant uh, dimension of, of watering uh, that uh, crops and, and herds and so on can in It's not an a insignificant uh, um, development with regards to uh, the Kurdish economy. Um, there are, as I said before, an enormous number of Kurds that are now in the cities. Uh, they, they moved in, in in one of those displacements, uh, and actually that started during the time that I was there. Um, they are pretty darn good workers. They are uh, well, re I mean, they're, by employers, they're well respected. They're good in the construction industry. Uh, they are taking care of buildings. In other words, they are the maintenance guy for buildings. Um, we had, and I hope this doesn't sound demeaning, I don't mean it that way, but within the context of my job, we had a Turkish, I mean a Kurdish maid. And my wife loved her. I mean, she was, she was terrific. And spoke beautiful English and you know, so the Kurds are not a, uh, you know, a 14th century civilization by any means. They still have, and they have aspirations, and they, uh, somebody said that they're 70% on the internet. That's, that's huge, you know. So uh, they have just been badly treated by history and by a lot of other people, too. Could you comment on the educational system? You mentioned that uh, the women, uh, the, the solution, as you call it, uh, educate the women and so on. Could you describe, comment on the educational system that the Kurds have for their society? Um, well, in Turkey, that's one of the bones of contention. They didn't have one. And they, they, kids were required to go to Turkish schools and speak Turkish. And that basically is still true. Uh, one of the um, points that the, um, the um, Kurdish political party, the HDP, had as its platform is that Kurdish schools would be established in the southeast and, and taught in the Kurdish language. But that really hasn't happened yet. As far as uh, the KRG is concerned in northern Iraq, they have a school system, a public school system, that is not at all unlike what you would find in, uh, in any um, public school system throughout Europe and the United States. Now, they are not as influenced by the Majli, the, uh, the uh, Islamic schools, the way the Arabs are. So, in fact, I don't even know if they have them in, in Kurdistan, in uh, northern Iraq. So, uh, I don't want to relate that back to my comment about women, though. I mean, it was just, that's their school system, and it is what it is, so. Joe. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Let's go uh, to today. Can you show me on the map where the Russian plane was shot down? 
Yeah. And show me where that big pool of oil is that yes. we're talking about. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Let me find the best map here. Uh, let's see. I got to go to a larger map. Okay, that'll work. Okay, uh, the Russian airplane was shot down as it meandered into um, Turkish airspace here. Okay, all right, I'm coming, I'm coming. As it meandered into Turkish airspace here. This little thing sticking down here is Turkey. In 1938, that's Hatay province. In 1938, it was ceded to Turkey by the world court after a plebiscite was held there, which was fixed. But nevertheless, Turkey got it. And Syria wants it back. To this day, they want it back. It's probably 50% Arab, 50% Turkish. But the Russian airplane flew into Turkish airspace here and was shot down by an F-4. And the pool of is between Kirkuk and Mosul. Now Mosul is not on this. Oh yeah, it is. Mosul is right here. Kirkuk is here. That's about a hundred kilometers, and it's twelve kilometers wide, and it's very deep, and it's good, rich, easy, accessible oil. Do, do you got it over here? Uh, now I got to find it on this side. Mosul, Kirkuk. And Kirkuk is now in the Kurdish area. This map is a little bit dated. But Kirkuk is in, un, unquestionably in the Kurdish area. And Erbil is the capital of the KRG right there. And the question is, the, the Raqqa, the uh, ISIS headquarters, is over here on the Euphrates. This gives you a good shot of the Euphrates, too. And you can see how it comes down, and that's the west versus, west versus the east shore of the Euphrates. Okay, that answer your question, Joe? Okay. Next. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, on the subject of Kurdistan. Um, there's a lot of stands in the region, and... Uh, 40 million people are aspiring for nationhood. Where do you think the current dynamics will take us as a future of a state for 40 million people? Is there a possibility of this happening? I know the Turks will be dead set against it. The, most of the governments will be against it. But is there, is there any government that is really willing to push that agenda? I mean, the Russians, for instance, do they see a weakening of Turkey, which is on their border by supporting a Kurdistan? The answer to your question, unfortunately, is no. I don't, s the question was, is there any dynamic at work, whether within a, the context of a national strategy of any of the players, or some kind of a coordinated strategy amongst the players to create an independent Kurdistan state? And the answer is, as far as I can tell, no. Um, there, what I said within the presentation, there have been local, regional kinds of movement toward autonomy and perhaps independence. Iraq, KRG, Turkey, PKK. Syria, the PYD. Um, but the idea that somehow or other all of the national interests of the host countries, the current host countries, could be overcome to create this, this uh, state of Kurdistan, I simply don't see it, not in my lifetime and perhaps several lifetimes going forward. Not to say it's not deserved, not to say that it shouldn't happen, uh, but that's not the way history works sometimes. And uh, 
you know, it's a, uh, as I said, uh, it, it, Kurdistan exists in the minds of 40 million people. That's what Susan Maslas said in her book, quoted it, and that's, and that's about the best as it's going to get at the moment, in my opinion. Well, Do you know anything about the assimilation of Kurds in this country? Are they doing all right? Are they clannish? You know what? Or? I don't know. I really do not know the answer to the question. Uh, and there was not a huge Kurdish diaspora like there was with the Armenians. I mean, the Armenians are half of California or something. I don't know what they but there are a lot of them out there. But, but the, the point is that there has not been a, a, a Kurdish diaspora throughout the world. There are about two million Kurds in Europe, as I said, and they are very radical. These are the guys who are calling for, for uh, Kurdish national entity. The, the, the really, the, the enthusiastic uh, noise for a, uh, a Kurdish nation is coming from the uh, uh, ultranational Kurds who are living in Germany and France and Holland. Uh, but I don't know. Does anybody know how many Kurds there are in the United States or where they are? I have no idea. I'm coming. Question? Okay. We're kind of talking about the Kurds as being uh, like they're blacks versus whites in the United States. How does one tell a Kurd? If a Kurd is a Shiite, does he go to the same mosque as the non-Kurd Shiites? I mean, it, it seems to me, how does one know that one is a Kurd? And how did you know that your maid was a Kurd? She told me. Okay, okay. But otherwise, and, and obviously she was educated in English. Huh? And she, all, she obviously knew English, you said. Yeah, she knew fluent English. Did she know yeah. Turkish? Yes. And she knew her dialect of Kurdish? Well, I can only assume that, yeah. Yeah. But how does one di differentiate? Well, I mean, look around the room, the, the Italians, the Germans, the, you know, the Poles, uh, who, who in here stands out to you? I, I, I'm being facetious, of course. Um, but there are no, there, there have been an enormous number of pictures taken. In fact, in that book, there are pictures of, of there were figure studies, physiological figure studies of Kurdish women and men and that were done by the British primarily in the 1910-20 era. And, you know, to draw any conclusions about the shape of their nose or, the, or, or anything like that, that, oh yeah, that's a Kurd, I don't think you can do that. I, I really don't. Um, they're, they're, so I would say that physiologically there are not any significant distinguishing characteristics, as there are not with all of the agglutinative populations that exist on the earth. I mean, we've done a good job of mixing ourselves up one way or another. So, um, you know, it's strictly uh, association. Where do they live? What do they do? What, what's their uh, agenda? Uh, you know, what organizations do they belong to? Um, the villages in eastern Turkey that are under onslaught at the moment from the Turkish military, they know that they are all Kurds living in those villages because the Turks have left a long time ago. The Turkish population of those villages left a long time ago. So, I mean, just where they are kind of reflects the fact that they are Kurds. I, I really can't give you a better answer than that. What? Um, they have native dress that is very, very, very colorful. They don't wear the chadar. They don't, I mean, even though they're Muslim, they don't um, cover their women's faces. In fact, quite the opposite. The women are dressed attractively. Um, um, like I say, they have native costumes, but by and large, they they look day to day. They look like everybody else. 
All right, I would like to wrap this up. I want to thank uh, Bob for taking time for... <clears throat>